you're very consumer-based. 70% of the economy, Lisa outlined some of these tensions are there. Is this the point where the consumer finally gives up the Biden stimulus and the boom? Yeah, I think so much of what you were just talking about is where our concern lies. And, and it is around uh, the potential for a credit crunch to, to really put a restraint on <clears throat> the consumer that we haven't seen you know, as you said, since the since the crisis, the consumer has was flush with cash. Then they had very high savings, and they've really been able to extend, you know, their spending long beyond I think what people had expected. The the shock of of sharply higher interest rates, not really seeming to put much a dent of a dent in demand. But I think when you now combine that with the credit crunch and, and Lisa, as you pointed out, looking in the <coughs> results that, you know, that we're getting to try to see to, to what extent there is some bite in that. We're looking at the senior loan officer rate is to see how much uh, credit conditions are tightening. I mean, all of that, we think, will right. come together to put uh, some real pressure on the consumer in a way that we haven't, and, and tip the economy into a recession later this year. Miles away, folks, May 5th. Lisa, I don't think this is a good number yet. Change in non-farm payrolls, the survey is 175,000, which is below 200, below the convention we've seen uh, during the COVID uh, boom. And Michelle, what does that glide path do? I mean, David Kelly over at J.P. Morgan talks about a negative non-farm payroll statistic. Are we going to see that this year? That. Yeah, well, that would be our forecast. We've got negative GDP growth in the second half of the year, uh, a recession. And so, of course, alongside that, we'd expect to see negative payroll prints. We've got the unemployment rate rising a bit, uh, like over a percentage point, getting to over four and a half by the end of the year. So, we, you know, we do expect that you will see the strength of the labor market taper as as the overall economy uh, really begins to slow. And it really comes back to the the impact really of the tightening in financial conditions, particularly now exacerbated by the by you know credit standards being tightened and the bite that that will have on both businesses and the consumer and and in general I think just more caution and optimism, particularly on the part of business now given. Uh, given the environment is, is I think, much more uncertain going forward. Michelle, how do you push back against people who say with the auto sector, there's a lot of specific details that are, I don't want to use the I word, but let's use it, idiosyncratic to the auto sector, that you're seeing sort of a tightening after an incredible loosening there, and you're not seeing the same kind of pressures in the services sectors and some of the other spending uh, facing kinds of areas. How do you push back and say it all will suffer heading into the end of the year as we see some of these uh, tighter credit conditions bleed through. Well, and that's exactly the point. I mean, autos may have some idiosyncratic issues, but but autos and other kind of cyclical spending areas tend to be the the early warning signs. That's where you know trouble seems to first uh, present itself, and very well may be the first area that we see issues now. And it is our expectation, particularly as we think about. Uh, the economy worsening, businesses getting more cautious, you know, hiring and labor demand, you know, beginning to wane. All of that will feed through into a broadening out of the of the weaker spending patterns that are now evident in just some specific areas. And so, you know, that is the point. Is is that yes, at the moment it looks fairly narrowly focused, but but that's <clears throat> often how these things start, and then they and then they broaden out. And the trends that we're seeing, as I said some of the leading indicators about where business spending and activity and so forth are going that, that precede broader demand changes, you know, that's the stuff that we're watching and signals to us some slower, some, you know, much more headwinds ahead. Will that, those headwinds be enough to bring inflation to where the Fed wants? Yeah, I mean, that's been, you know, we've been really skeptical about inflation being able to get back to 2%. But but now I think with even more confidence that the economy is going to, you know, be be weaker because of these of these headwinds. I, I think we do feel that the odds of the inflation rate, you know, getting back to two percent without the Fed having to take rates as high as we had anticipated, um, you know, we're, we're more confident about that. We don't have inflation getting back to target until 2024, <clears throat> but we also have taken off some of the expectations for for Fed rate hikes that we have. We think the Fed is done. I mean, may they go again in 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 May? I guess right. possibly we're not dug in about that, but. But essentially, we're sort of at the peak in rates, and we've actually got the Fed, you know, cutting rates 
uh, into 2024. Well, Michelle, bring that over to the yield market, to where we actually price all this mumbo jumbo. There is a narrative mm -hmm. that we're hearing, not from all, but from some, that yield comes in from here, 10-year yield comes in 3%, dare I say, under 3% as well. I would suggest most of our audience on radio and television doesn't believe that. Are you setting us up for a 2.95% 10-year yield? <laughs> we don't have yields going quite that uh, low that fast, in part because you do, got, you do have um, – you know, inflation that is still going to remain uh, sort of stubbornly high. And also, you know, in the sense that it won't really fall below, uh, I think we've got it at the end of the year at 3%. Um, it won't get towards target. It won't put the Fed in a position to be able to lower rates until until later in the year. Um, and I think that that provides, you know, I, I think it slows the speed at which you can actually see yields move dramatically lower. And so, you know, that is the trend that we see. But I think the the pace of all of that unfolding may take longer than than some expect. Michelle, it sounds like you're conservatively positioned, and I'm curious how painful it's been over the past couple of weeks as basically markets shrug off a lot of the gloom and doom and managed to rally. It's, you know, I again, as, as we know in the economics, uh, you know, field, I mean, you've got a whole host of data that can tell a bunch of different stories. And, and the bottom line is, is that, uh, no one can really be confident, the Fed included, about exactly what the path will be, what other, you know, what other events may, uh, you know, get thrown in to alter expectations. And so, I mean, I think in general, I understand the resilience because if we're talking about the Fed having to do less, if we're more open to inflation coming down closer to target with the Fed doing less, perhaps a stage set for, you know, a path where the Fed can cut rates sooner. I understand that there's a um, you know, some relief that goes along with that that can provide, you know, some support. But, but you know, when the data do start to, I think, more uniformly suggest that the economy is going to be in for, uh, you know, some struggles, uh, then, you know, again, then the question about market pricing and, and, you know, do market prices accurately reflect underlying economic, you know, fundamentals will be tested.